In this week's episode, we visit with Greg Pixley to see his plans built CX-4. This is the first airplane I ever built, the CX-4. All right, so I'm back here at the Sky Ranch in Baker, Florida, and today we're gonna to talk about the CX-4, Thatcher CX-4. I'm Greg Pixley. This is the first airplane I ever built, the CX-4. Originally, I was gonna build a two-place Sonarai. I bought a kit off, I don't know, eBay or something that somebody was selling uh, with the plans, and my wife was looking at it, and she found out that I fly it from the back seat and she goes so the passenger sits in the front seat I go yeah she goes so I'm gonna be like your airbag and I'm like no you're gonna ride in the front seat well it became clear up front that she was never gonna fly in that airplane so I made a decision that I was not gonna finish that airplane actually I never did any work on it but I had this kit so I went to Sun and Fun one year and I saw the Thatcher CX-4 and I'm like man that's a pretty nice looking airplane and Dave Thatcher goes, you want to sit in? Go ahead. And it fit perfect. The plans were right. And I said, I want a set of plans. So I bought a set 2009. It's a scratch built. Uh, you build the forming blocks, you bend the aluminum, you do everything. So I got the plans, ordered a kit from Spruce, which showed up on four by 12 foot pallets of flat aluminum, all the different thicknesses you need. Uh, and I started making forming blocks and bending aluminum. Uh, and three years, nine months later, I had a finished airplane. Uh, so was this 100% plans built? Or there's some parts I think Dave or some people offered to help you out like the cowlings or I, I bought canopies or? The cowling, the canopy, the engine mount uh, from Dave. Fortunately, the Sonarai kit that I had was the same landing gear wheels and brakes so I had and the spinner uh, wheel pants so I, I had a bunch of parts already all right so being this is scratch built uh, and you had to make all the formers uh, I know some people make them out of wood or MDF plastic or what did you make your formers at for the I guess the ribs and bulkheads or which formers did you have to make uh, you you have to make them all for the ribs and the bulkheads uh, I use that hard MDF uh, plywood so you can sand it, form it. Uh, some of them I had scrap oak and I made it out of scrap oak. It was just, you know, what I had and what seemed to work best. Now what did, what did you use to cut out like the lightning holes after you, um, you know, you made your, your cutting blocks on your forming blocks? Did you use a router to cut stuff out or how did you physically cut the parts out? <clears throat> some of the parts, uh, like the, the wing ribs that were all pretty much all the same, you could stack those up they have holes in them for the forming block bolts to go through. You can center those, stack them all up, and just use a router around the outer perimeter to cut the aluminum. does a pretty nice job. Uh, and then form those tabs over. That seemed to work well for me. Uh, with the one-off parts, you just hand cut. Uh, I had a bandsaw. I used a bandsaw a lot for, for cutting both the wood and the metal parts. Uh, because I did a lot of metal cutting, the bandsaw, I had to do a like, three to one reduction so the, the, bl the blades lasted a lot longer than a regular wood cutting bandsaw normally would. Now for the lightning holes on the ribs and maybe some of the bulkheads, did you make your own flanging dies or how did you accomplish I, the flanging? I bought a set of uh, punches to cut the holes uh, and, and then I believe I made a set of flanging dies to to do the do the flanges. I think I've still got boxes in the attic of all that stuff. Um, and, and it's interesting, you can tell the quality of the forming blocks by looking at the various thatchers, the you can see the ripples or the, the you can tell by the metal work of how much time they spent making the forming blocks and that's really really the key uh, following the plants, getting the lines right on those forming blocks to, and then lining stuff up. 
as a, as, a, as a scratch builder, um, what do you think was the most challenging to build this? And also what was the, the funnest part of building this? Well, uh, one of the things that was challenging is the fuselage because the aft part of the fuselage is built on a two by four with some angles and there's various points and you've got to line various bulkheads and then skin it. Um, the plans are pretty simple. If You've got to look at how other people did it and, and there's a learning curve. Uh, I made one mistake where the last part of that fuselage, you put on a sheet, piece of sheet metal and I was drilling holes. Well, the farther you got back, the pushing ended up putting a twist in the fuselage and I didn't realize that until I got all the way back to the end bulkhead and then I realized that that side motion of the drill doing all those holes was introducing a twist. Hey everyone, let me take just a moment to thank our sponsors that make all of this possible. Great companies like Airworks, AirTech Coatings, Clemens Insurance Agency. Find links to each of their websites in the description below and tell them you found them here on the Experimental Aircraft channel. And if you haven't already, I invite you right now to subscribe, hit the like button for this video, and check out our affiliate links in the description below. So for those of us who haven't built a Thatcher before, or scratch built a plane, um, and you know, with modern kits being match holds, you don't really even have to have jigs, what do you use, like a, a four by four or two by four to, as a center line through the middle of the bulkheads, or what do you do to try to keep that square all the way down and to align as you go through the bulkheads? Well, that's a good question. I would say the best advice I have, because it's been, it's been 11 years since I started building that airplane, that you need to be aware of where the loads are when you're drilling holes to make sure everything stays straight because that last panel I put on the fuselage was already built, the jigs were gone and it was being held by pla in place by all the aluminum skins. Mm. Uh, so I thought, you know, it's a, it's a closed structure except for that last piece of aluminum going on the side and I'm like, that thing's not going to go anywhere but uh, side loads was able to twist it. Okay. I ended up having to build a new aft bulkhead to take the twist out of it. And so you, you built the whole airframe and there's a couple different uh, engine options. Which did you choose to power this? I used the Great Plains uh, 2180. Uh, and what horsepower is that? It's an 80 horse. Just under 80. Okay. And what? And now that's built and flying, you've been flying it for a few years. What kind of um, first? How many hours are on it? But what what are your performance specs on this with this engine? We've got just over 250 hours on the airplane, and uh, it, it'll cruise at 120. So, so this is probably very light on the c controls. What does it weigh in at? About 590 pounds. With, with gross at 850. Okay, so yeah, that's that's really lightweight. I would imagine you're you're very. Uh, on, on the rudder and on the stick on final approach on this. Yeah, very light. The controls are very responsive. Uh, <clears throat> Talk to us about your instrument panel and why you decided to go with what you did here. A steam gauge, old fashioned steam gauges, and what else is in there? Steam gauge is simple. Uh, all the engine instruments, uh, tachometer, fuel pressure. <clears throat> it's got mag and electronic ignition. So you, you start it on the magneto once the engine's running bring on electronic ignition it's got two electronic fuel pumps I only use one and then uh, if something were to ever happen I've got a second one as a backup um, voltmeter people go why did you why did you put the voltmeter in upside down I, go, I don't I ran out of panel space and the only thing I need to see on the voltmeter is that it's in the green so upside down was the easiest way uh, from a human factors to see the green. If it's in the green, then I know that the uh, amp meter's charging. And uh, I've, I've seen people do that in race cars or motorcycles because at a quick glance or even your peripheral, you can just see where the needle's at. Right. Right. That's all I need to know. Uh, it's got a fuel selector shutoff that 
it's in the way when I get in the cockpit, so I got to turn the fuel on. Uh, I've only had one problem with the engines buttering in flight, and that was because it, I found out that at the end of runway checks, somebody made a call on the radio and distracted me when I was doing fuel pump checks from left to right, and I had both fuel pumps off apparently, and I took off with the fuel pumps off, and on climb out, the engine started to stutter. I uh, pulled the throttle back instinctively, and it started running fine. I came back around and landed to find out what was wrong. And when I realized what the problem was, I went up and did checks how long the engine would run with and without fuel pump. Uh, and it turns out the air pressure, if I go over 100 miles an hour, thing will run all day long without the electric fuel pump so the, the ram air into the fuel tank yep, will cause enough pressure it. how about that but this yeah. has a header tank That's so then it's probably pretty much nearly level with the carburetor or just a little bit higher it's just a little bit higher than the carburetor so it won't run full power it'll run at reduced power thanks for watching this week's episode remember to like and subscribe check out the description below our sponsors and affiliates I'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.